Hey everybody, today Rotto runs through his top 25 most anticipated games for 2022. And hello, Happy New Year! I hope uh, this year is going to go great for you, I hope it's going to go great for everybody. Surely, surely, as a whole, as a species, we are on an upward trend, right? Even with all the setbacks we are all facing, and, and so many of our fellow humans are facing out there, um, you know, my, my best wishes to everybody. Today, I just want to talk about how excited I am about all of these new games that should be, not always, but should be coming out in uh, the coming 12 months. And uh, before I get going, I've got 25, but oh man, I could talk about 50 or 75. In fact, I might actually stick around and do some Q&A with my live stream audience who is watching right now on Twitch, and maybe we'll talk about some additional stuff if you want to stick around for that. But I do want to say, in this top 25, one of the things that's really important to me when I'm making these lists is I really want to celebrate new stuff. Um, which is why there are no expansions or no, um, you know, like, 2.0 remake deluxifications, any of those kinds of things, because, well, I mean, I mean, don't get me wrong, I would be excited about those things, I could be anticipating those things, but I want to tell you folks about 25 new games that you may very well never heard of, even if you watch my show. Um, also, another thing I'm leaving off the list, I do a lot of Kickstarter previews for games that are in development, prototype stages and all that. I've left all of those off the list as well, with one exception. One exception, we'll get to that. And uh, it doesn't mean I'm not super excited about those. It's just that I've already talked about those games a lot on my channel. I've devoted hours of programming to them. So I really want this to be about 25. Whoa, what the heck is that? Where did that come from? New exciting experiences uh, for you folks and also for me. So that is the broad remit I am, um, I am applying to all of these. And uh, with that out of the way, I think we're ready to go. So let's see. I did not test it. I tested this two hours ago. Hopefully the transition will still work when I go over to um, starting at the, at the list. You know, and this is a countdown, so this is my least anticipated, but hey, I'm anticipating all these things. We'll get to my most anticipated at the end of the list. My um, number 25 is... That's the wrong button. Let's try this again. My number 25 is... Silicon Valley. Oh boy! What a great way to ring in the new year. My very first show of the season, and I make a big uh, scene transition goof in front of 150 live viewers. Hopefully the audience will forgive me, but it can only go smooth sailing from here, folks. Let's talk about my number 25, Silicon Valley. Uh, from Grail Games, they have really been on a tear for the last few years. A lot of really great stuff they've been putting out, high-quality productions. But I'm equally excited about Scott Alms, uh, who I think most people know Scott as Mr. Tiny Epic. <laughs> you know, uh, Tiny Epic Dinosaurs, Tiny Epic Galaxies, Tiny Epic Defenders, you name it. He's Tiny epic it with Gameland Games. This is different. This is a game that goes 60 to 90 minutes. So this is him dipping his toe in bigger, uh, more ambitious in scale games. I'm excited because of that. I'm also excited because of the subject matter uh, in this game, which unfortunately there are no pictures yet. That's going to be the case for some of these. All I've got is text and maybe a box cover art. We are running Silicon Valley, um, you know, startup companies. I love that subject matter. I was a creative director in the video game industry for 20 years. So, you know, tech startups are very near and dear to my heart. But I love this in the description. It talks about how we determine uh, what products we're making in our startup based on the patterns of our polyomino tile laying. And I love that. I love polyomino tile laying games. But here's the thing. Polyomino tile layers are usually lighter affairs. You know, 30 to 45 minutes. This is a 60 to 90 minute game. That makes me think, is this going to be more in the realm of a uh, Feast for Odin type scenario? I don't know. We don't have that much information yet, but I am very excited about my number 25 on the list, Silicon Valley. Then we go on to number 24. Tiles of the Arabian Nights, which, first of all, I should say, as far as I know, has absolutely nothing to do with the uh, classic storytelling board game Tales of Arabian Nights. I'm sure this is like a, a wink and a nod in the title, but this is from Holy Grail Games and um, from a really... So, I, I don't think enough people know about the design team of uh, Matthew uh, Potterman and Oliver or Olivier uh, Mellison. They uh, put out a uh, museum and they did Dominations, and um, 
Oh, uh, a game that's coming up pretty soon, Encyclopedia, which I've played a few times, and it's fantastic too. So I've been really impressed. They do uh, run the gamut from um, lighter weight gateway stuff to really heavy crunchy stuff as well. And first of all, let me just say, this game looks gorgeous. It looks spectacular. Uh, and it is a, a basically a tile exploring game as we travel around the world going to collect various and sundry things, or various sundry tiles, which I think there's some kind of set collection element, but what we're trying to do is collect these tiles, have these adventures, have these encounters, and uh, these represent a story that we are trying to tell when, at the end of the game, we make it back to, I assume, the Rajah's Palace or something like that, and um, our final score is based on how good a story did we tell. I love that. I love the idea. I love the presentation. This game looks gobsmackingly gorgeous. Which, again, should not come as a surprise. You've seen some of the other stuff Holy Grail Games has done. So, um, I am very, very excited about this. I have to admit, I didn't read too terribly much about the gameplay here as soon as I saw the design team, considering how really impressed I have been with the three games of theirs i played so far, Dominations, which I'm hoping to do a run-through for um, in 2022, and Museum, and in Encyclopedia, which I know I'm doing a preview for, I, I, I had no choice. I had to put Tiles of the Arabian Nights in at number 24. Then we go on to number 23, Astrum. Now, uh, design pedigree, once again, plays a big part. Ivan uh, Tuboski is the designer behind, um, oh, what do you call it? Uh, Aquatica. Aquatica is fantastic. Oh, I love Aquatica so very much. I think most people who've played it do. And, you know, and so, uh, here's a big follow-up from Ivan. I think he may have done some other things, too. But um, I'm excited because I've loved Aquatica so much, and the expansion for it as well. I'm excited because Russian uh, developer-publisher Cosmodrome Games has just been knocking it out of the park. They are one of the best-kept secrets in the board game industry. Um, you know, I mean, there's this, there's this new generation of amazing... Um, Amazing Russian designers and developers that, you know, most of the board game industry, oh, we're still waiting to hear what's coming out of France and Germany and stuff like that. Everybody, turn your eyes towards Russia, because Cosmodrome is great. Ivan is great. But, uh, all that aside, let's talk about the game. Look at it. It is so pretty. As I understand it, we are royal astrologers, or would it be astronomers? Basically, I'm not quite sure, but our job is literally um, the king, or the, the sultan, or whoever, I don't remember, you can read it in the uh, description, has um, um, gotten us to be the ones to design the constellations in the night sky. And we're doing it with polyomino tetris tiling. But look at those polyominoes. They're see-through. They're transparent. So when you put them down there, you're actually making Orion's belt, or the Big Dipper, or whatever it might be. This is so cool. Cool. What a great, very cool use of clear, transparent polyomino tiling with really bright, colorful, exciting gameplay from a designer who has already knocked it out of the park, made one of the best mid-weight car, um, you know, engine building, car drafting Euros of the last few years. And so everything about this game, which apparently looks like folks were playing at Essen, I guess, is where all these pictures came from, uh, everything about this game screams must have. Which is why it comes in at, what was it, number 23 for me, uh, uh, Astrum, um, which just goes to show how much more exciting stuff there is yet to come. So let's move on to number 22, Mythwind. Now this is actually one I very much wanted to cover when it was on Kickstarter last year. It looks so cool. I'm not really familiar with the previous works of the designer or the publisher, but the ideas behind this game, I think, are fantastic. It's basically, let's see, oh, I went the wrong way, I went the wrong way. Let me go the other way. It's basically the idea of, uh, this is almost, as near as I can tell, you would not be out of the realms of uh, correctness to call this, a, uh, what would you call it, um, Animal Crossing the board game. Or maybe a Stardew Valley, for that matter. Although there it is already a Stardew Valley, the board game. But this is a gentle, cooperative game of peaceful building. We are all players who have very specific 
asymmetric abilities. You know, I don't know if it's as asymmetric as a as a root or something like that, but as I understand it, very very asymmetric gameplay and um, really a lot of interdependency. One player might be the builder, the other player might be the merchant. Both players are playing very different games, but we both have the common goal of trying to make the town or the region grow and be prosperous and all that. But the interesting thing is, this is not a game where okay, let's just sit down. Let's start with a new virgin territory waiting to be built. And at the end of the game, we've done. In this game, the world continues to grow and evolve game session after game session after game session. Like an Animal Crossing. You can just play and play and play. Um, and I love that idea. I also love the I mean, the miniatures, which normally I'm not a big miniatures guy, but the miniatures really capture the art so nicely. It looks stunning to me. Now, if you want to know more about it, I mean, you can go check out the Kickstarter page. I think it was on Kickstarter. Um, I mean, I didn't really because I was just so excited about the core ideas. I knew, okay, this is definitely one I want to check out. I love the presentation. I love the ideas. I, you know, I, I love the overall change, the approach to uh, gaming that, hey, how about a game that lives and breathes? And we want to keep going back, not so I can beat you after you beat me last time, but so that we can watch our world continue to grow and evolve and see where will it go next. That is beautiful. I want to see more of that in 2022. Communal, making the world a better place, and that's what Mythwind is all about, which is why it makes a list. Okay, then. Let's move on to number 21, Terracotta Army. This one uh, made my list. Uh, mostly, again, designer pedigree. Adam Kapowski, and I'm sorry, your co-designer, um, uh, Zemslav Fornal. I, I, I don't know Zem's uh, 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 pedigree, but Adam blew me and a lot of people away. Oh, that sounded kind of dirty. Sorry, I just had to finish the sentence. Um, you know, blew a lot of folks away with his previous game this year, Origins First Builders, which was a phenomenal... Um, you know, kind of gateway plus civilization game that posited the question, well, what if aliens helped early mankind build the pyramids and get us a leg up? I mean, that's just a really cool setting to explore, and it was a really, really great game. And what's interesting, okay, I need to look, I need to look at a little bit deeper at Adam. What was interesting is it kind of came out of nowhere because before then he was known as the Lords of Hellas guy and the Frostpunk board game guy. He was known as this big, bombastic Ameritrash style gamer, but then he came out with one of the best Euro style games. So. Uh, Adam Kapinski has my attention. But then on top of that, Board and Dice, oh my gosh, it feels like the, uh, the last few years, Board and Dice can do no wrong. They handle everything beautifully. I just respect and admire so much how they run their business and, um, and their gameplay, their design chops and their development chops are fantastic as well. Uh, but anyway, what is the game itself? We are helping to um, create the famous Terracotta Army. I read the rules, uh, you know, the description. There's not really enough here to hang my hat on, so it's really more about pedigree here to put this on the list. But one other thing, a few years ago, I covered a game called Xion. Starts with an X-I-A-N. And um, from... Uh, Oh, I can't remember the designer. Another Italian designer. There are so many Italian designers now, and all their names mesh into my head. Francesco, I want to say. Francesco, um... Oh, I'm sorry, I don't remember. Anyway, Xion, if you go watch my run-through, was fantastic. And I really fell in love with the idea of helping build the Terracotta Army. And there's so much to learn about the history. So another game that, top, uh, that tackles that same topic from a designer I really respect, and a publisher I really respect, well, no surprise, it made my list, Terracotta Army. Okay, now let's move on to number 20, series. Oh my goodness, Artipia Games is back. I have to admit, folks, I was a bit nervous. I mean, if you've been paying attention to the, uh, the business side of the board game industry, some publishers have done really well. That They have been able to capitalize on the situation our world is going through and, and get games to people who are stuck at home looking for entertainment. Other publishers have really struggled. Some have gone out of business. And we hadn't heard from Artipia for a long time, and I was starting to get worried because I love those uh, developers, designers down in Athens. I've actually been to their headquarters once when my wife and I were on vacation in Greece uh, many years ago and I met them. My wife actually helped them pack boxes. So bear in mind, I, I, I can't really say I consider them, you know, close, fast friends, but I mean, I have a warm spot in my heart for Artipia. Never mind the fact they have put out some of the best games of the last few years. Fields of Green and, um, oh, uh, Pursuit of Happiness. So many amazing designs, and I'm glad they're back. A big uh, asteroid mining corporations outplay your opponent and rule series. Uh, you know, it's, it's a worker placement game, as I understand it. Again, not much to see in terms of pictures, uh, unfortunately, but... There, all that aside, I, like I said, I love Artipia. 
I love worker placement if you can do something new. Um, but another thing I read here, and I really, really dig, where is it? Um, series has been co-developed with an astrophysicist for the best possible thematic application, um, and it brings a couple of innovative twists to worker placement. You had me at innovative twists and um, consultant astrophysicist. Yay! Uh, as, as our industry grows up, and you know we're, we're out of our toddler years, and we're starting to get more mature, and we're, we're starting to approach our subject matters uh, with a bit more um, care, and respect, every time I see this, I love seeing that this is just like, oh, well, you know, I just went and I looked on the Wikipedia page, figured that's enough I need to know about Ceres and asteroid mining. <laughs> Let's just make the game. They bring in experts. They bring in professionals. So that the game will hopefully, I suspect, be even more fun, um, but also more, um, you know, have a greater verisimilitude. And so I'm a big, big fan of that. I'm a big fan of Artipia games, which is why Ceres makes a list. All right, then. Let's move on to number 19. Get on board. New York and London. Now, um, I said right up front that I was trying to avoid, you know, deluxe 2.0 remakes and stuff like that. I do. I have a couple of them to call out, uh, specifically when they make big, big changes to what has come before. I'm not just talking about, you know, changing the art, changing the setting, but changing the game. And I am so excited about Get On Board New York and London because I really loved its predecessor, Let's Make a Bus Route, which is a very, very cool roll and write game that does what almost nobody does. Players work on a shared board. Why do we not see more of this? Why, in every roll and write, am I always on my board and you're on your piece of paper, why can't we write on the same piece of paper and interact with each other? And um, Let's Make a Bus Route did it brilliantly. My problem with the Let's Make a Bus Route was it was terrible as a two-player game. No work was done to scale it, to tighten up the board. Get on board. The board is two-sided. And I think it re represents different boroughs of, you know, this. or no, I guess it represents different cities. Hopefully the two-player board is London. Hopefully, oh, London is my wife's favorite city in the world. Um, so I'm excited that this gameplay is coming back, but fixed now for two player games plus a really cool um you know change the presentation style I, I really really dig the retro feel to it um you know Sashi and Sashi. I'm sure, I mean, I, I, I respect them greatly as developers but I'm so happy Yellow has worked with them to bring um the game to the next level so that my wife and I can love it because I mean I actually uh let's see where did I get this no I paid through the nose to get the uh sequel to this the uh uh, let's make a bus route the dice game. I had to import it all the way from Japan. It costs more to ship it than to buy it. Um, but, um, you know, I, I'm so excited about this. Of course I am, or else it wouldn't be on the list. That is a Get On Board, New York and London. Okay, how about we talk about number 18. From Reiner Knizia, we've got My City, the Roll and Write. By the way, folks, warning... If you're tired of roll and rights, I'm sorry. Did I not mention up front? I am just an endless font of positivity. I love games. I love roll and rights. I am far from over with them. And um, I put, but I put all my roll and rights together back to back. So we'll get through them fairly quickly. If you don't like roll and rights, sorry. I love them. I also loved my city. My city was a great uh, polyomino Tetris tile layer from Reiner Knizia. That was a literal legacy game. And it worked wonderfully. I loved everything about it, except the way it uh, handled its ongoing gameplay. They really kind of tripped uh, across the finish line, which was too bad. But I am very, very interested to see what they do turning it into a roll and write. Looks like there are no pictures, unfortunately. Not really much of a description. I don't need it. Like I said, my wife and I, we both love roll and writes. We love the tactile feel of, you know, of holding a... I just reached for a pen and I grabbed something else. Uh, holding a pen in our hands, making decisions. We like playing roll and write for the most part with pens. So your decisions are permanent, final. You got to live with it. It adds this extra level of gravitas to every decision we make. And um, and like I said, My City was fantastic. And Reiner Knizia is deservedly one of the most respected, uh, most influential, uh, most prolific board game designers of all time. So I am always on board for whatever the good doctor he actually has a doctorate, although in, math in mathematics, I think. I think he's a mathematician by day. I'm not quite sure. But anyway, My City, Roll and Write, very excited. Okay, now I think we've got one more Roll and Write, so um, hang on, folks. Let's talk about number 17, The Isle of Cats, Explore and Draw. The Isle of Cats, I'm not sure if it's my number one tile layer of all time, but it's in my top five tile layers. And that's saying something because tile laying is one of my favorite mechanisms of all time. The Isle of Cats was so phenomenal. And now we have a new Isle of Cats. And there are no pictures on Board Game Geek. Wait, no, or we're there, we're there. 
uh, yeah, there's not much. There's not much. Um, and I was kind of bummed by that. Although, right off the bat, that gives me a pretty good idea of why I'm excited to play this game. Um, you know, drafting cards, different cards coming out, trying to fit those cats on board. Looks like it comes with... or uh, No, it's probably a dry erase game. That's okay, too. I, I don't mind. But, uh, let's see. What I wanted to do while I was talking about also, that's why I had the videos queued up. Hey, Ruel! Um, of uh, uh, Tabletop Night, where Ruel, my co-host on the r r show, uh, plays games with his wife, Michelle, several times a week. And when I saw that they had played this back in May, and he never told me about it, and I only just found out about it this week, I'm like, Ruel, WT, can I say F? Uh, but that F could stand for anything. Um, do you still have this? I want to play this so very much. I am very, very excited about it for all the reasons I just stated. So, um, and by the way, folks, if you would like to know more about it, go check out Ruel's. He streams live on Twitch several times a week, but he archives everything on YouTube. What the heck? I'll put a link up in, in the show notes and up in the top right corner. If you want to go check out his channel, go watch his run through of Isle of Cats, Explore and Draw. Tell me if I was right or if I was wrong. But anyway, so... I am stoked. And I think we have now ended the uh, roll and write portion of the show, and we can continue on to number 16, Pocket Master Builder. This is another designer thing. Uh, Wai Min Ling is a designer that I suspect probably 99% of folks watching this channel have never heard of. And I think that's a crying shame because he's fast becoming one of my favorites. I have played two of his previous designs, Walking in Murano and Walking in Provence. They're both fantastic. They both do amazing solo modes, but putting that aside, uh, they were both really wonderful Dense, crunchy, and yet super simple, elegant games. Both very different gameplay styles. And so, um, the other week, I was wondering, well, what's he even up to yet? Because I really like to play some more. And I looked up. Now, it says here, it's 2021. I have tried. I have edited this and said, hey, um, Board Game Geek, I actually contacted the publisher, my man, and they said, sorry, it's not going to be out until 2022. They haven't fixed this yet. It's not a 2021 game. They are planning on 2022. There's not much to say about it. Um, other than, this is a card-based worker placement game. And so you know, here's what some of the cards look like. As we're trying to uh, build up the uh, defense, the, the city and the defenses of the city, because barbarians are coming, as they often are. But the interesting thing is, as you place these cards down and build up the city, you are creating worker placement spots. Whenever two cards go next to each other, they create a new worker placement spot that if you send one of your workers there, you'll get things. That's awesome. That is a very, very cool idea. I mean, we've seen this before. Uh, worker placement games where you build the worker placement board as you go. But that combined with tile laying? Oh my gosh, that's a great idea. And considering um, what a fantastic designer um, uh, uh, Wei Min, or is it Ling? Is Ling his first name or his surname? I'm not quite sure. But anyway, Wei Min Ling, considering how great the walking in games are, go watch my run throughs. I've covered both of them. If you want to see more, oh my goodness, I'm very excited for Pocket Master Builder. Alrighty, then let's talk about number 15, <laughs> um, Star Trek Missions. And, um, okay, I would understand if you were to say, hey, wait a minute, you said right up front, you're not doing any kind of revamp 2.0 re-themes. Okay, maybe I misspoke. Um, because, yeah, that's what this is. This is basically Publisher WizKids going back to their big monster hit card game, Fantasy Realms, and I, I'm sure tweaking it and rebalancing it and whatnot and turning it into a Star Trek Next Generation era game. Must have. Fantasy Realms is fantastic. And also, as an aside, so is Red Rising. I know Red Rising is a bit of a Marmite game. People love it or hate it. Uh, my wife and I, we both thought it was great. And we think Fantasy Realms is great. And I suspect Star Trek missions will be great as well. Now, I'll be honest. I look at these pictures of the cards where they're just doing some, like, Photoshop colorful filters. I don't know if these are final over stills from the from the show. It's okay. It's not my favorite. I would have liked to them. You know, I mean, these days there are so many amazing AI based things that make um uh you know pictures look like hand drawn. I would have loved for them to do that, but that's okay. That's okay. That's okay. The gameplay is going to be great. And one thing I can say that I really dig is looking at these cards. They look like they really paid attention to get the theme right. Worf wants weapons and combat cards. Picard wants to be on the bridge, but he also is an explorer. He wants to have other locations. I really appreciate that, that they have, this is not just a, okay, let's just throw it all together. Let's, um, you know, I am sure the developers were fans of Star Trek. And so they are probably 
probably doing the property right, which is one of the reasons I am very excited about Star Trek Missions. I feel a little cheesy about it, too, that I'm rating it so high. And I've played Fantasy Realms, but I don't care. Star Trek is one of my favorite IPs of all time. And um, my only wish is it had been um, either uh, original series or lower decks. Because, uh, blasphemy alert, maybe people will talk to me about this in the Q&A afterwards. Next Gen is almost my least favorite Star Trek show. <gasps> anyway, though, but still, I'm very excited uh, for Star Trek missions. Okay, let's move on to number 14, Autobahn. All right, I love this subject matter. The idea of building the Autobahn. I have driven the Autobahn many times. Back when my wife and I lived in Europe for, gosh, what did we live there? For 15 years, something like that? Maybe not quite 20. Anyway, though, we lived in Europe for a long time. I've driven the Autobahn many, many times. And uh, I've, 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 I've never seen... I know, I know nothing about it. I know absolutely nothing about it. And the idea of uh, uh, playing through multiple periods, a long history of time, including playing through the reunification of Germany. Um, in, you know, and when that happens, this opens up opportunities to further extend the networks into the eastern part of the country. I love that. I love a game that will bring history to life. An a history I probably never thought about, but probably will prove to be very interesting. So, uh, all of this stuff is very, very cool. But what's even more cool is Fabio Lapiano. Another designer I am falling in love with. Um, Autobahn. Well, okay, I'm sorry, not Autobahn. Uh, Merv, Vergusa, Kalimala. I have Kalimala. I haven't played it yet. I have played Zapotec. And, um, yeah. Although, weirdly, Zapotec is listed as a 2022 game on Board Game Geek. Is that still the case? Have they fixed that yet? I tried to fix it. Nope, it's a 2022. Even though the designer himself says it's a 2021 game. Regardless, whatever. Um, so, Fabio Lapiano is a designer to watch. He is definitely an up-and-comer. And, -comer. and uh, I, I love this cover art, which is unfortunately all we get. But I love the subject matter. I love the design. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, full props to Nestor uh, Amangone. Newton? Masters of Renaissance, Darwin's Journey, these are fantastic games too. Nestor always makes any game he works on better. Oops. Yeah, oh yeah. So, oh, ah, now I'm jumping all over the place. Did I delete it? Yes, I accidentally deleted it, uh, but that was Autobahn. Oh, there's my second big goof of the year. Oh, I'm falling apart, folks. But let's move on to my number 13, Unconscious Minds. Okay, I have to admit, I'm not familiar with designers Yoma, Laskas, Antonio Zax, but I very much am familiar with designer Johnny Pack, who burst on the scene a couple of years ago with three really phenomenal games. Coloma, Sierra West, uh, Fistful of Meeples. Is that right? Yeah. All great. All widely different games. All wonderfully designed. He has since then really started to make a name for himself, I believe, as a developer working with publishers, making any game he touches better. But here he comes back with a very, very cool bit of subject matter. Through dreams, Freud's followers delve into their patients' unconscious minds. Apparently, this is set uh, in 1902 during the Vienna Psychoanalytic Society meeting. And uh, basically, uh, there's not that much about gameplay here. Uh, you know, we're filling our notebooks. We're basically trying to analyze dreams of our patients. And about the only interesting pictures are, we'll give you an idea. Oh, with art from Vincent Dutre, by the way. Um, yeah, yeah, that's Vincent Dutre art. And Andrew Bosley, two of the hottest artists working in the board game industry, collaborating on one game. Wow, that's very, very cool. I think both of them made my top 10 game artists. So I, I just wanted just to look at it. But, um... Uh, you know, analyzing dreams, that is very, very cool. I imagine we're going to have some really wonderful Dixit-style um, art on our cards. I mean, I mean, look at these things if, if, if you're watching. And, and, and folks might be listening, I know, because, of course, I'm taking all this and I'm putting it on my monthly or my, my podcast channel as well, podcast.rao.com, if you'd rather listen to this on the go rather than be stuck in a chair watching. But anyway, it looks phenomenal. Johnny Pack has fast become one of my most must-pay-attention-to designers. The subject matter is something I have not seen touched before. I think maybe there have been a couple of other psychoanalytical games. So yeah, this looks phenomenal. Unconscious Mind. Okay, folks, and now let's move on to my number 12. Wayfarers of the South Tigris. I am very, very excited about this because, again... There seems to be a kind of pattern here. I guess as a former video game designer myself, I am instinctually drawn towards the work of other designers. And when Shem Phillips and S.J. McDonald get together to design something, they make 
magic. You know, the entire West Kingdom trilogy was phenomenal. Really cool stuff. Great art from the Miko. And in 2022, they're starting to work on their next trilogy. And I believe Wayfarers of the South Tigris is going to be the first one. And I don't believe there were really any images other than the cover art. Too bad. But I did watch. Folks, I cannot recommend this uh, Punchboard Party channel enough. Uh, Daniel Pepitas, I guess, the Punchboard Party. After I watched this, and he really did a deep dive, you know, investigating everything. Wayfarers of the South Tigris, which will be followed by Inventors of the South Tigris, and then Scholars of the South Tigris, and he was able to dig up info about these games. Um, you know, about how the, the, the common thread amongst all of them is dice and using dice in a different way in every game. Oh, yeah. If you want to know more, I'm don't listen to me. Listen to Punchboard Party. He did a fantastic job on a video, and I want to doff my cap uh, to him for helping me out, uh, giving me a bit more information, making me very, very confident that I am correct to put this on my list. Okay. Then let's move to number 11, Wormholes. From AEG and designer Peter McPherson, some folks may know who that is, in case you don't, the reason this is on the list is because Peter McPherson designed Tiny Towns. Tiny Towns, I believe, is in my top 25 games of all time. My top 25 or my top 30. It is so amazingly brilliant. So incredible. And it looks like Wormholes, I mean, it's a tough act to follow, but Wormholes is his next big game, 45 to 60 minutes. Probably going to be, I would assume, in the uh, same, you know, uh, quick playing, uh, you know, probably really, really simple rules, but de deep, crunchy gameplay. Unfortunately, we don't have any pictures. We have a description. Uh, this is, now here's the thing, folks. This is a network and route building pick up and deliver game. And that is not something my wife and I tend to go for. So it has to be a very, very special game that will draw us in. And this one is about, oh, we're building um, routes across the galaxy to be able to transport passengers around and stuff like that. And it's uh, you, can tie, you can bend space and go fast. So that's all very, very cool. And, you know, the, the cover art is certainly quite nice. AEG, I mean, I, I just did a top 10 games from AEG a few weeks ago and expressed my deep abiding love for them. They're one of my favorite publishers. So all signs point to greatness with this game, but it's really, considering how amazing Tiny Towns was, that I have to, that I am so excited for Peter McPherson's Wormholes. Then we go on to my number 10. We're in the top 10, folks. You've made it this far. Let's talk about Frozen Frontier. We're back to Cosmodrome games. Everything I said before uh, about Cosmodromes is, uh, is equally valid here. I am very, very interested in what they have to offer. Now, this is interesting. I have not seen a two to three hour game from them before. So this is really going in a new direction. And I think this might be um, uh, Andre uh, Kol uh, Kolopev's first design as well. I think it is, yeah. So, but the thing is, Cosmodrome has done enough work to get me engaged and get me involved and to get my trust level for their abilities high, high, high. Now, the game itself is a far-flung future. Earth, it hasn't been destroyed and we're not running away from Earth. It's just Earth is too overpopulated, so we have no choice. We have to um, branch out to other planets. And wouldn't you know, the only planet we can get to is the most horrible, terrible, binary planet where it's permanently one side is in, in non-stop over boiling hot light and the other side is in frozen darkness but this is the best we could do and we have to colonize this thing and players have to even though this is a competitive game work together to get this planet under control and uh, make it a successful colony so humanity can um, you know take their place amongst the stars so i love all the subject matter but more importantly i love cosmodrome I love the presentation, so there's a lot to recommend here for this game. I'm trying to remember, did I actually read the gameplay description, or was I just... Uh, right. Oh, yeah. No, so that's the other thing I was really interested in. A competitive game where players are incentivized to collaborate with each other. I always love it when a game pulls that together, especially if it works in two-player. Now, it usually doesn't. Usually you need to have three players, but this is a two-player um, uh, game. It even has a solo mode, so I am definitely down to give this a go. Uh, I mean, I, again, uh, mostly because of the pedigree of Cosmodrome games. I'm very, very excited. That's my number 10. Let's go on to number 9, The Weather Machine. Okay, folks. I know I said right up front I wasn't doing games that I covered when I was previewing them on Kickstarter. Uh, surely I covered... I, no, I didn't cover Weather Machine. So, uh, this is my first time I've ever talked about it on the channel. Although I don't really have much to say other than designer Vita Lasarda, artist... 
Ian O'Toole, publisher, Eagle Griffin Games. This is one of the big triple threats of the industry right now. I remember talking to Vital a few years ago about you know his move over to uh, Eagle Griffin and how happy he was because they really let him spread his wings and um, you know and 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 he was so excited doing his best work and this game looks phenomenal. Uh, it is, I, I, and it's also, most of his games are really grounded in, you know, historic or scientific simulations of history or the modern day. And he does a ton of research and really focuses on ensuring, um, you know, uh, design fidelity where everything in the game mirrors what's in the real world. And he will just throw everything in the kitchen sink in the game to have a deeper, richer mirroring of the real world. As I understand it, this one breaks the trend. This is more of a steampunk game with the cutest little robot meeples you've ever seen. As we are actually building weather machines, um, you know, in a, you know a Victorian steampunk time frame. So this is a really new thing for Vital, and I'm very very excited about it. I always want to try all of his games. Sometimes his games are perfect for us. Sometimes. They're, they're perfect for what they are, but they're too heavy for us, and we end up having to say, oh, it's not you, Vital, it's us. This, I've heard, this is definitely on the heavier side. I don't care. I'm not undaunted. I want to check it out, and which is why it is my number nine uh, most anticipated game for the year, Weather Machine. Then we go on to number eight, Terraforming Mars, the dice game. Oh, yeah. Terraforming Mars, Ares Expedition was so good. So good as a way to re-envision the Terraforming Mars gameplay. And as far as I am concerned, greatly improve on it. Huge improvement. I mean, I will play Ares Expedition over regular Terraforming Mars any day of the week and seven times on Sunday. And I love rolling dice. So bringing dice in, and not dice to roll to resolve to see, oh, did we succeed or fail at our task, but rather dice that represent the resources that we need to build. While still, it looks like doing a whole bunch of card tableau management as well. Um, yeah, I'm all about this. Very, very excited considering how they really, as far as I'm concerned, totally knocked it out of the park with Terraforming Mars Ares Expedition. So yes, of course, Terraforming Mars, the dice game, makes a list. Then, let's talk about number seven, Free Radicals. Oh boy. Um, I am excited for this one. In part, because I'm very lucky. I have an early copy of it. It is literally set up on my table next door. I'm reading, that's another thing I'm doing this afternoon, reading the rules for this so I can sit down and play it with Jen so I can get a run through for you folks in um, January to show you why I'm so excited about this. But I'll tell you right now, why am I so excited about this? Well, a couple of reasons. Let's talk about one. Um, I love the presentation. This is basically a Blade Runner, you know, cyberpunk type future that's happy, that's bright, that's colorful. Instead of always the, I mean, you know, I mean, hey, Ridley Scott is a, is a master artist. It was an incredibly uh, influential film, Blade Runner, and, uh, and all that. But can't we have a little color? Does it always have to be raining and midnight and foggy and sad and depressing? Can't the future be happy and vibrant and upbeat? So, honestly, I just like that just as a change of pace. Just to not do the same old tropes over and over again. But that's not why this is on the list. Honestly, that would get my interest but wouldn't put it in my top 25. The reason I'm interested in this is because this is... From what I've seen so far, this has got to be one of the most asymmetric of all the asy asymmetry is becoming hot. You had vast, then you had root, um, you know, and, and uh, you know that really kind of put the idea. And now we've, we're seeing it more and more and more. Um, uh, what was the other one? Oh, uh, Merchant's Cove is another one that where you know where each player. Yeah, it's not just that we have different characters who have their own special abilities, but we're all playing the same game. These are games where oh, we're playing radically different games. You're playing a roll and write. I'm playing a polyomino tile layer because we have different roles, and what how we play our little mini game is driven by the thematic constraints. This game does that to an eleven. It really pushes that agenda in a really really big way. Um, you know, each player's board. Uh, you, I mean, obviously, we're all in the same world. We're still all dealing with the same resources. We're still achieving the same goals, but we all do them through radically radically different. I mean, look at the difference between these player boards. They, they, they look like they come from different games, other than the fact that they have a consistent art style. And I love that. I love that so much. Now, if you'd like to know more about it, I first heard about this uh, back in Essen time, or maybe it was Gen Con time, because, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, Oh, it wasn't. It wasn't the designer Nathan who did this uh, presentation of it. 
I think it was, was it Daniel Solis who's in this video? Uh, yeah, there's Daniel. Well, I think he was the graphic designer. I think I misstated the fact that he was the designer. He was the graphic designer on it. And he walks through how all of these different um, jobs work radically differently. And when I saw this and, and saw you know, how the entertainer is so different than the merchant uh, and, and so on, I was like, oh my, oh my gosh. I want to play all of these games. I cannot wait to do it. And honestly, no offense, I'd rather be in the room over playing this right now. But that will wait till tomorrow because my wife's upstairs. Uh, she's uh, working on some gamer glass for some clients. So that's got to get done today anyway. But uh, I'm gonna I'm starting off the, the new year with a bang by playing some free radicals. Okay. Then let's move on to my number six, Astro Knights. Okay. Aeon's End is probably the premier this is really weird years ago i asked my uh patreon subscribers hey I'm, i was thinking about doing this top 10 this month uh, top 10 fantasy adventure card games cooperative fantasy adventure card games and i thought no one's gonna want to see that that's such a weird little niche thing but it occurred to me at the time, like, oh my gosh, there's so many of these. Now I could actually do a top 10. And it turns out they wanted to see it. And it turns out it went on to be one of my most popular top 10s of all time. So there is, and, and, and I mention all that because Aeon's End is at the top of my, uh, ca of that category of fantasy uh, cooperative adventure card games. Astro Knight takes the uh, fantasy setting of Aeon's Inn and transports it into a kind of Buck Rogers 25th century, um, you know, adventures across t space type milieu. And I love it. I am very excited for this. And now you might say, hey, wait a minute. Isn't this just going to be... Oh, no pictures, no pictures, unfortunately, other than the box art. Isn't this going to be another one of those, well, it's just the same game. They just put a new coat of paint on it. No. They have radically changed core elements about the game. And, I, and actually, I should say, Aeon's Inn and Astronauts is a deck builder where we're trying to get cards to level up our character to fight big bosses. That's what Aeon's Inn was. That's what Astronauts is. But um, well, I think one of the reasons Aeon's Inn is so well-loved is because it uses the, uh, what do you call it, the Dominion uh, collection of fixed piles of cards that we're building from. So it's much more strategic than other games of its ilk that do the river approach. Astronauts, its number one goal is to try to streamline the experience of Aeon's End. So you can set it up and play faster. There's a lot of setup for Aeon's End. And, um, you know, it can appeal to a broader range. And one of the things they're doing is they're keeping the individual piles, but each pile is a randomized, shuffled up deck of a particular type of card. So it's really interesting. It's kind of having its cake and eating it too. It's got the Dominion um, strategic, okay, well, there's all these different cards. We know their types of cards interact in different ways, but every time you play, every time you take a card, it reveals a new one underneath. So you have that sense of discovery and excitement and exploration that, like, uh, Legendary gives you, you know, the river of cards. So it combines these, and I don't see, I've, I've never seen another deck builder that does it. And I'm, I was already excited because, hey, it's Aeon's End, uh, but, um, revamped. But then when I saw, oh, they're literally rewriting the rules for deck builders, must play, which is why Astronauts makes it so high on the list, but not as high as Tileton. Or maybe it's Tileton? I'm not quite sure. Uh, this is another one from Board and Dice, and sadly, I got nothing. I got no video. I got no pictures. I don't even have box art. So this must be a ways out, quite frankly. But what I do have is Simone Luciani and Danielle Tassini. That's the team behind uh, Zulk and the Mind Calendar, which is in my wife's top five favorite games of all time. And um, when these two work together, they do amazing, amazing things. Uh, and um, interestingly, I, I really appreciate that the setting for this one is not them going off to far-flung environments, as they've been known to do in the past. Uh, they are keeping it at home. This is about Renaissance-era merchant traders trading in Renaissance-era Europe. Um, you know, so they're, uh, you know, not... Uh, you know, kind of running into, hey, are you celebrating colonization and, and stuff like that? I mean, they're just focusing on, and I, I appreciate that. I mean, not every game out there has to be a, well, let's go out and just try to mine all these different cultures all around the world to turn them into fun games. Now, don't get me wrong. When it's done well, when it's done with respect, like Zapotec what did from um, the same publisher, Board and Dice, I think it's great. But hey, I love traipsing around um, sepia-toned Renaissance-era uh, Europe. So, great. Let's have some more of that. But let's have um, bringing back together one of the greatest design doers, duos of all time for a game that I admittedly know nothing about. I didn't read hardly any of this. There is, oh, no, I did. I did. Because now I, I just scanned it. And, okay, so all that's great. 
Here's what's even greater. This is a dice management game where the dice, of course, I assume they're D6s and they have colors. And, um, you know, the dice are rolled and you have to draft the dice. And here's the thing. The color of the die indicates... Um, what the uh, action you're going to do is. The number of dice indicates the amount of resources you're going to get, but they're tuned so that the more power... Let's see. Uh, once you use a die, gain a number of uh, corresponding resources equal to the value of the die, then perform. The power of the action is inversely proportional to the value of the die. So the fewer resources you gain, the more powerful the actions you take, and vice versa. Okay. If you're like me, that makes you salivate. Now, if you're not like me, that means you're a normal person. You say, okay, what's the big deal about that? That sounds really, really cool. That sounds like a game rife with just agonizing compromises and tough uh, trade-offs and decisions you have to make every single round. I love it. And I have no idea how to pronounce it. Hopefully, uh, the uh, pronunciation will be in the rule book. Another thing I love about Zapotec, which I uh, mentioned earlier from Board and Dice. Did I mention it earlier now? Am I just bringing stuff up randomly because I'm forgetting what I actually talked about in chat versus what's in this video? Anyway, though, Board and Dice did a great job with putting a pronunciation guide in Zapotec. Tech. Hopefully they will, because I have no idea how to say Tileton, so that's what I'll call it for now. Okay, my number five. Now, let's move on to number four. Divinus. Or, um, yeah, Divinus, not Divinius, Divinus. Okay, Lucky Duck Games is great. Everybody, sing along. Lucky Duck Games is awesome. Uh, you know, they have just been knocking out of the park for a few years now. They started out just doing relatively, um, you know, simple, straightforward, hey, let's just get the uh, license for this popular mobile video game, and then we'll make a board game out of it. But over time, they have just gone from strength to strength. And they are now, at this point, just a few years in, one of the powerhouses in the industry. And um, the designer, uh, Philip uh, Milunski, well, he designed Warsaw, City of Ruins, which is one of the greatest tile end games of all time, as far as I'm concerned. And CV, one of the greatest card drafting games of all time. And some other stuff, too. I think I played Magnum Saul. Everybody loves Destinies, also from Lucky Duck Games. So, uh, right, you got me on pedigree. Fine. I know the game is going to look amazing. I know the game is going to play fantastically. But what is the game itself? Oh, folks. Oh, folks. It's a... Where is it? Legacy game. Oh, finally. Remember a few years ago when um, Pandemic, uh, the, the first Pandemic Legacy 1 was such a huge hit. Everybody was very, very uh, gloom and doom. Oh, from now on, it's nothing but money grabs. It's nothing but legacy games. Games we have to tear up and throw away after we're done filming. Legacy games are the worst. And I remember at the time saying, no, legacy games are awesome. I hope we live in a world where more and more and more legacy games come out because... Every time you make a decision, and it can't be undone, that puts so much weight, so much gravitas on that decision. It's, I mean, it, when you create a legacy by putting a sticker on, by ripping up a card, whatever it might be, I love it so much. And I'm so sad that the um, Doom and Gloomers, um, it turns out they're, uh, they, you know, it did not come true because it's really hard to make a good legacy game. It's a huge investment in time and manpower and testing because of all of the stuff that goes into it. But, oh, look at that, putting uh, Pythia's amulet permanently on that card and you're going to put another one on later and that changes the card forever. Oh, that just makes me so happy. Um, and another thing, too. Legacy games tend to, uh, to, I mean, because... I mean, so many of them are, um, you know, in the Pandemic Legacy mode. They're, they're adventure games and whatnot. They're cooperative games. This is a competitive Euro game that looks gobsmackingly beautiful from an incredible design and development team up. It's Legacy. Hopefully... Oh, and also, another thing. I didn't mention Lucky Duck is also very well known for digital integration. So how about a Legacy game that pushes digital um, storytelling and branching narrative in a way that nobody else has ever done. They talk about it a little bit in the description. It almost sounds like um, the AI on the app is able to make informed um, direction decisions based on the choices you make, which sounds very, very cool. It says it in here somewhere. Oh, the app will remember and present contextual options in the future that are impacted by your decisions. Now, that could be really simple. That could be, oh, they're just replicating the function of a deck of cards that you look for cards in. But if they push this, they have the potential to make this a more ambitious and responsive legacy game than we've ever had before. I mean, everything's lined up for this. It looks amazing to me. And for all the doom and gloomers to say, ah, oh, it's a cash grab. They make me pay a hundred bucks and I have to pay a hundred bucks again if I want to play it again in six months. 
Uh uh. Because they're very, very clear that once the campaign is complete, you can replay your unique copy with a post campaign infinite replayability mode. And that is awesome. All that means is there's a really long prologue for the game where players customize and make their own personal version of the world that's unlike anybody else's out there. And then it continues to be fun playing. I've got high hopes for this one. No surprise, because it comes in so high on my list. And yet, somehow, folks, there are even higher games on this list. So how about we talk about my number three, Dice Realms. Now, I have been waiting for this for years, it seems like. And I'm pretty sure publisher Rio Grande Games was confident they were going to have it out last year. But the um, what has to go into the production of this game with so many hundreds and hundreds of pieces meant that it didn't quite make it. So now they're very confident it'll make it out this year. But, you know, that's just production quality. What is the game itself? This is a... Um, it's not a deck builder. It's not a bag builder. It's a dice builder. And we've seen a few games like this uh, in the past. Um, you know, Dice Forge. And uh, another one from Real Grand Games. I can't think of the name of it right now. There's been a few of them. And um, they're all very cool. I absolutely love the idea of being able to customize my own dice over the course of the game. And then roll them and say, Why did I put this on that die? That's all I'm getting now. Or why won't you give me what I want? You know, I love everything about dice building. The thing about Dice Realms from one of the greatest card game designers, or let's just say modern board game designers out there, Tom Lehman. Um, you know, Tom Lehman, as, you know, he is second to none. Everything he does is just amazing, and it always has been. I have nothing but respect for him as a creative design genius. And I don't know if this is his magnum opus or not. I'm sure that's tough to follow Race for the Galaxy, but this is a big game with a lot of bits. Very big. Very ambitious. I have been excited about this because, again, the other Build Your Own Dice games that have come out, um, oh, that's right, Tom actually um, did a uh, did, did a Build Your Own Dice expansion for his role for the Galaxy as well. I remember that now, too. All those other games have been fairly simple, straightforward, lightweight games. This promises to be a big, heavy gamer geek game with Building Your Own Dice, with a million pieces, and I can't wait. So that's why it comes in at my number three. But there's more, folks. Let's talk about number two, Marrakesh. If you know my channel, you know there's no way I don't put a Stefan Feld game on my most anticipated games every year. Of course. And 2022 is going to be an amazing year for Felds because he actually has like almost a half dozen games coming out because Queen Games is doing a whole series of revamping his older designs. Remember, I said right up front with only a few exceptions, I was trying to stay away from those, but I did. I mean, Marrakesh is brand new. Uh, design we have not seen before. Influential families react to the whims of the cube tower to gain power in the city. Oh, yeah. I can't wait for this. I love Stefan Feld. His design brain just meshes with my player brain so well. I am never disappointed. I am always tickled pink. And my wife is the same. It's like somehow he designs these with us in mind. I know one thing he does is he does the vast majority of his playtesting of his games with his wife. Maybe that's part of it. I don't know. Maybe that's why all of his games, even though they work great at high player counts, always work really well at low player counts too. Um, but all of that aside, uh, what I'm more excited about than anything else, and I, it's on behalf of my wife. Is there a picture of it? Is there a picture of the dice tower? In this... No, it doesn't look like it. All right. Do, do, do. He comes with a bunch of stuff. Lots of stuff. Yep, there we go. Um, you know, the, the, the Cube Tower has existed for a long time. You know, Shogun and Wallenstein, they kind of introduced the idea, and then it never really took off. Uh, Stefan Feld, years later, did Amerigo, which was an amazing game. I know not everybody likes it, but it's one of my wife's top ten games of all time because she loves that Cube Tower so much. Since then, was it Kevin Wilson did a great Cube Tower game. It was a co-op fantasy uh, tower climbing tower game as well. But Feld going back to Cube Towers and giving us another big, bombastic, super Feld experience, of course. And any other year, folks, this would have made my number one. But I am going to be very cheeky and reveal my number one now. And um, please bear with me. My number one is Plunderous. Yes, that's right. That Plunderous. The Plunderous that when it was on Kickstarter two years ago, I was listed as a co-designer. And um, I don't know if I could pull that off anymore, because, but I love this steampunk game of uh, piracy in a steampunk Mediterranean world. 
uh, or I'm sorry, not Mediterranean, Caribbean world, full of gigantic mechs, uh, full of really deep card and dice play. The way the cards and dice interact in this game is absolutely brilliant. I've always loved it. And believe me, I have been playing this game in one form or another for years because the designer is a friend of mine. So I just I have to preface this, folks. Um, if... If, if you're unhappy with me putting the design of a personal friend of mine that I have personally worked on in the number one slot, that's okay. Imagine Marrakesh was my number one, and my number 26 would have been Hacktivity, by the way. Go check out Hacktivity. It's a very, very cool new cyberpunk take on deck building. I, I talked about it in, a, in an r and episode with Ruel a couple of months ago. Hacktivity. Um, but if you don't mind, let me talk about why I am so in love with this game. Um, you know, and, 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 and where it's been, because... It was on Kickstarter a couple of years ago, you know, and as is often the case with new games, it didn't quite fund. And, um, you know, uh, my friend, Andrew, went back to the drawing board and he tried, his, and he's been spending now the last two years almost, I think, or over a year and a half now, trying to address all the concerns of everybody who was interested in the game, but we're like, well, but I'd really rather be more like this. And the game is so revamped now. Um, this when, when Andrew originally set out to make this game, he wanted to make a steampunk pirate game that would rival uh, Twilight Imperium. And both in terms of breadth and depth, and, um, you know, sandbox-free gameplay, and also length. Because he hasn't updated this yet on the uh, on Board Game Geek, but this is still listed as a up-to-six-hour-long game. That was his intent. That's what he set out to do, and he figured, well, you know what? A lot of people love uh, T- Twilight Imperium. Surely there's an audience for that. He found out when he went on Kickstarter, no, there's not. There's not much of an audience for a three- to six-hour game anymore. Uh, you know, Twilight Imperium kind of gets grandfathered in. Uh, so he went back to the drawing board, and he found ways to streamline this game and basically express mode it to where it is now, I think last time he checked, it's on average about 40 minutes per player, which is Jen's in my sweet spot. Now, here's the other thing about it, though. It is a 4X game, uh, you know, exploration, expansion, exploitation, and uh, extermination. And she so might say, well, that's a game I tell try to stay away from, right? One of the things he's done really well here is made, I mean, and whenever a game can do this, whenever a game can make non-violent, what the heck, let's put my video of it I did two years ago, or a year and a half ago. Let's put it on screen so we got something to look at. Um, any game that can um, put in, you know, player conflict but in a way that the game doesn't require it at all. And it never makes you feel like, wow, I'm really kind of suffering by my refusal to engage in piracy and thieving and attacking and all of that. I mean, it's rare, but I've played the occasional game that features player versus player stuff that I don't feel like I'm compromising my ability to win. I'm playing suboptimally if I ignore all that as a Care Bear. Plunderous is a game that pulls that off. And if that weren't enough, when I say I've worked on it, well, I've given him so much feedback. So much of this game is a direct reflection of suggestions and design direction. If you ever wonder, hey, is Rado ever going to design a game? This is as close as you're ever going to get. Now, I'm not the lead designer. I'm at best a consultant, although I did it all for free. I stand to make no money off of this game. So just for a record, uh, you know, there's no funny business here other than the fact that the designer is a friend of mine. And I put a lot of my own blood, sweat, and tears into this. I am very excited. Uh, the plan is, uh, it, w- it would have been on uh, crowdfunding sooner, except we had to switch, or I should say, he had to switch graphic designers because, you know, he did so much changes. Uh, you know, he had to go back to the Miko and get a bunch more art from the Miko. Miko's my favorite artist um, as well. I, can't, I, I think I'm going to be in this as an as a art picture as well, so I can't wait to see that. Oh, boy. Anyway, though, um, I'm, I, long story short, I'm very excited. It looks positive that we are finally that he is finally going to be able to get it back on Kickstarter when he does I will do an updated run through for it to show how radically it's changed I don't know if I'll take time pointing out oh and that was me and that's mine and this is mine and this is what used to be you know, I don't I probably won't do that I'll just stick to the facts ma'am oh but then there's one other thing um the game uh ships with a an expansion that turns it fully cooperative and that's where I've given most of my feedback and I'm very excited for it I'm so excited. It's my number one most anticipated game of the year. Uh, Plunderous. And that's it, folks. Oh my gosh. Are you still here? Did you make it? Okay, then. Well, I'm exhausted, but I've got 163 people watching me live right now on Twitch. And so what we're going to do, I'm going to be right back, and we're going to do a Q&A section, and you can watch or listen along. Okay, I've given folks a little bit of time. We've got our first question from a first-time chatter. Uh, 
Tierno2 wonders, hey, what about all those games I covered? You know, because I mentioned this right up front, that, I mean, games that I had previously done previews for, I was leaving off the list. But there are a lot of really great games, and so I'm more than happy to talk about those. Let me go back to the browser, and let me go to the correct browser, and there's my number one, but let's go to wishlist.rado.com, which is a uh, URL anybody can go to. This isn't secret, it's just a list of all the games that are literally on my wish list um, and uh, at Board Game Geek. So, if I do a search for 2022, I mean, of course, I'm going to see a bunch of the stuff I just talked about. Oh, I'm going to see Frosthaven. Frosthaven, of course I'm excited about Frosthaven. Of course, it'd probably be my, my number two or my number three, especially because I did some design work on Frosthaven also. Don't tell anybody. Uh, one of the missions in it is mine, and I suspect it's probably going to be the most weird, different, game-breaking mission of all time that's ever appeared in any Gloomhaven or Gloomhaven spin-off game. So I'm excited about that. But again, I was trying to talk about new things for the most part. And Frosthaven is definitely, um, it is a Gloomhaven too. Right, okay, and oh, there's Hamburg and Amsterdam. You know, those games I was talking about, uh, you know, other remakes of Feld games. Planet Unknown. Man, I covered this a billion years ago. It is so good. Uh, really neat. I mean, as you can see, I mean, the, I'm in my must-haves right now. These games I will have. No matter what, make, my, make a mistake. I will own these games, provided they do come out in 2022. You can watch my preview for Planet Unknown. It's a, it has, at its center, it is a Lazy Susan game, where we're tile drafting off of a Lazy Susan. The tiles are polyominoes that we're building um, onto a you know, planet, that you know an unoccupied planet that we're trying to colonize. And then we're actually interacting with that planet as we put all the tiles down by driving little trucks all over it. Everything about this game is amazing. And it's been so long, I think a lot of people have forgotten about it, but it's cool. There's Divinius, there's Marrakesh, oh, more Feld stuff, Teltum, uh, all right, um, uh, Isle of Cats, Explore and Draw. As you can see, this was actually must hire for me, but I kind of, I wanted to put all of my, uh, what was it, all my rolling rights together, so I kind of put it a little bit higher on the list. Uh, oh, and I didn't talk about expansions. We're, um, Cold War, Manhattan Project, Energy Empire, Cold War is finally going to be here. And I, I cannot wait. A Manhattan Project Embry Empire is the greatest worker placement game of all time. And uh, oh, a New Frontier, Starry Rift, the expansion for it might finally come out, uh, which is basically what is New Frontiers is Roll for the ga Race for the Galaxy, the board game. And so, very excited about that. Terraforming Mars. Oh, Endless Winter, Paleo Americans from. Stan Kardonsky, fast becoming one of the hottest designers out there. Go watch my run through. This thing blew up so huge. One of the biggest hits on Kickstarter last year. Now or Never from um, Ryan Lockett. Everybody loves Sleeping Gods. Everybody says Sleeping Gods is Ryan Lockett's masterpiece. It's Now or Never. I like Now or Never more than Sleeping Gods. I'm just calling it here. Cannot wait. Uh, Zapotec is coming. We uh, had some talk about that earlier. Oh, there's Weather Machine was on my list. Uh, more Agricola... Con oh, The Unconscious Mind. Oh, man, that's so far out. Oh, uh, more Dominion. I, d I don't mind. Uh, let's see. Paperback Adventures. Oh, yeah. Oh, my goodness. Paperback uh, has made several of my top 10 lists. You know, uh, top 10 must-have games, top 10 uh, would take on a desert island type stuff. I love Paperback so much. Paperback Adventures takes Paperback, the deck-building word Scrabble type game, and turns it into a fantasy adventure game, and it works. It works so well. It is so brilliant. I cannot wait. Resurgence, another one from Stan Kardonsky. Uh, another really phenomenal one. I am hard-pressed to say whether I'm more excited about Resurgence or... Um, Oh, what was it? The uh, other one, Winter... Winter... Okay, I'm just going to say I'm more excited about researchers because all of a sudden I cannot think of the name of the other one. Oopsie. Let's see here. Uh, right. So, oops. Oh, dear. I just pushed that button. And let's see. Did you see it? Yeah, I think you did. <laughs> um, I don't think there's anything bad in there, but I was actually just trying to... Uh, right. I... Don't hit F12 when you're in Chrome and you're streaming live to hundreds of people. Oopsie. There's my third big goof of the year. Not starting off very well, folks. Um, Le Granha Deluxe Master Set. Oh my gosh. Has anybody heard about this? Has anybody heard the good news? Le Granha is getting a big deluxe reprint. It's coming with a bunch of additional design modules done by other famous designers, including a design module from Stefan Feld. Le Granha was already in my top 50 of all time. Feld is putting his stamp on it. Yes. Um, but again, I didn't want to include it because I, I mean, because Lagranha is great. And I mean, what I'm excited about is this expansion content that's coming, basically. Uh, artificial intelligence, I don't know. Anybody want to take bets on whether that's going to make it this year? Did I mention at one point that I was kind of, oh yeah, when I was talking about Artipia Games and how, oh, I was so glad they're back. 
because nobody's heard hide or hair of him for a while. I'm so worried. Are what's your game still out there? I hope so. Because I, I think artificial intelligence was what's your game, right? And was it from Nuno and um, yeah, and Paulo? Yeah, what's your game? It's been in development forever, along with their Brazil. I don't know what's going on. Uh, if anybody knows, let me know in the chat or in the comments down below. Is what's your game still out there? I'm holding out hope because they're one of my faves. And they're wonderful people, too. I've met them in real life at Essen a few times. Let's see, going out. Oh, Perseverance, Castaway Chronicles, Episodes 1 and 2 from uh, Dave Turchie. Watch my previews. Such a great game. And what really shocked me is Jen enjoyed it, too. And I did not think she would enjoy this stranded on a deserted, uh, mysterious island full of dinosaurs. Fight all the dinosaurs and fight for survival co-op game. But she really dug it, dug it too. Um, right. Oh, Dead Reckoning. So we did cover this on the channel, but it was Ryan who did a rules run through. And I said, no, I don't want to do it. I don't, I don't want to play this game. This, I was talking about Plunderous. Hey, it's a pirate game where you don't have to fight and you um, won't feel like you're missing out if you focus on other things. Dead Reckoning really struck me as, no, you got to fight in this game. You got to be ready to pirate your other pirates. But they didn't say when they were talking about if I wanted to cover it, that they had a co-op mode they were developing. So now I definitely want to play it when it comes out to try out the co-op. Let's see here. Oh, Monsters on Board, a wonderful game full of great Miko art, a really very clever and very kooky and offbeat thematic, uh, what do you call it, dice drafting game. All right, Chicago. So now we're getting into stuff that didn't quite make my top 25. I'm interested in Chicago. I don't know enough about it. And I, I well, let's see, is there anything to say about Chicago right now? Oh, it's uh, it's from What's Your Game? So, but I think I think this has been on Board Game Geek for a long time as well. So again, I, I still wonder, um, you know, SOS, I'm sending out, or no, I'm trying to receive an S, is there an SOS from What's Your Game out there? Um, I, I need proof of life. I want signs of life. Okay, Astrum I talked about. Oh, Merchants of the Dark Road. What a brilliant Rondell game from Brian Sewer, I believe, was the designer. Um, really thematic. Lots of really offbeat, very clever and fresh and unique design decisions and a great production as well. Definitely one to watch for. Alrighty. Oh, On Mars, Alien Invasion. Um, remember, I, On Mars was one of those games that I was talking about, uh, Vita Lasarda, that, okay, maybe it's just a bit too much. Uh, on Mars, Jen's like, nope, this is too much, too much going on. But they've released a cooperative Alien Invasion, so I gotta try that. I gots to, mister. Vivid Memories. Um, my wife loves this abstract game that tries to out Azul Azul at the Azul game, and I believe it succeeds. Uh, I did a roundup for it, and uh, I, I'm very excited for this one. Uh, um, who's the publisher on that? Oh, that drives me nuts. Now I gotta look that up. Is it, is it Floodgate? Yes, it's Floodgate. Floodgate from Dunstan and Gilbert. Oh my goodness! It's, it's go go watch my. It's a, I did a short rundown video of it. It's really good. A uh, Transatlantic too. I loved Transatlantic. I, um, you know, a lot of people said, oh, why would I have this if I've already got um, Concordia? Because it did a lot of things different. But I, I think it, I mean, and Transatlantic was really designer Matt Gertz. Baby, that was like his dream game that he's been, you know, working on and moving over forever. So I'm sure it was always kind of a bummer that it just didn't, it, you know, it suffered in the shadow of Concordia because uh, it had some of the same mechanisms. But I'm, which is why I'm very happy to see uh, uh, Transatlantic 2 is on the way, that there is life in the old girl. All righty. Um, Darwin's Journey, I covered that. Really good uh, Euro game uh, about, uh, you know, Darwin or, you know, a ship. Uh, contemporary ship of Darwin's, traveling the Galapagos, um, you know, going out, doing expeditions, really clever, good stuff. Silicon Valley talked about, oh, Shogun no Katana. Wow, this game has such a really clever, uh, what would you call it, um, blacksmithing. I mean, it's it's a big, heavy, you know, rich and deep worker placement game, but it, at the center of it is this very, very cool sliding puzzle that represents the actual craftsmanship that goes into literally banging these katanas into existence. Really clever. Uh, Architects of the West Kingdom is getting more expansion stuff. I can't believe it. Uh, all righty. Uh, Book of Villainy. Why did I... Okay, this one. I don't remember at all. Why did I put this on here? All righty. Um, what is it? I'd have to look. There's something I like about it, but I don't immediately recognize the publisher or the designer. I mean, I like the subject matter. Commit silly crimes as B-list villains and write a book about it. I really like everything about that. Maybe I just like the... Hey, sometimes I just like a theme that's really, really different than everything else. And Book of Villainy certainly seems to have that going on. I, I have not looked at this list for a while. Um, all right, so uh, Verdant, no, Verdant, not Verdant. My whole life I've been saying this Verdant. And when I did my run through for it, and I said it like 20 times Verdant, and everybody came out of the woodwork and said, You're saying it wrong, and you've been saying it wrong since you were like 12 years old. Ha <laughs> ha. And I just said it wrong again. All right, it's Verdant. Verdant is a very, very cool game. It's up there with Flourish and, oh, 
Meadow. Uh, it's another one of these really brilliant uh, card games. Oh, and it's it's from the same team as it's been doing. Um, oh, what what you know that that great triple team, right? Yeah, Molly Johnson and um, Sean Stankiewicz and Robert Melvin and then Kevin Russ, Mr. Calico. You can watch my run through of this. This is a beautiful, wonderful entwined drafting game. Really, really excited for the final of this one. I thought it was fantastic. Oh, uh, dice table e or emergency roll. Hey, I believe this is a roll and write set uh, in a hospital. That sounds great. I'm excited. And um, oh, Motor City. Why would I put Motor City on the list? That does not sound like me. I don't care about muscle cars. Oh, because it's Pinchback and Riddle. And I really dig Pinchback and Riddle. And it's a strategic roll and write game. And Pinchback and Riddle's Fleet the Dice game is one of the best roll and writes ever. And um, I think, was this one like Fleet that had, it was like a double? Um, all right. So I don't care about the subject matter, but uh, Pinchback and Riddle making another roll and write said, yeah, let's learn more about Motor City. But apparently I didn't like it enough to make the top 25. Because uh, I haven't covered it. Then the spill, that's a very, very cool cooperative game about trying to staunch the flow of an oil spill off of a leaking oil derrick. That looks really cool. And uh, Oak, actually, I'm going to be covering that in the... I, I, have, I think the prototype's going to show up in the next week. So it's, as a, uh, it's a beautiful looking game about druids doing foresty stuff. Um, I read the rules, and it sounded pretty cool, but I haven't played it yet, so I wasn't sure how high I rate it. Federation, though, oh my gosh, this is a fantastic game uh, about interstellar. It's like, a, it basically, we're senators um, in, um, not Starfleet, What is, in Star Trek. What is, Starfleet is the military exploration arm of the United Federation of Planets. This is, a, this is ba if, if they, if they could have gotten the Star Trek game, they could have called it the United Federation of Planets, where we all sit on the Federation Senate and we're voting to try to give aid to other planets and get favors from other planets and trying to sway votes in our direction. It's brilliant and it's gorgeous. And I don't think enough people know about it. Okay, Anuki, Dawn of the Gods. Why did I mark this? It doesn't even have a picture. Oh, because it's got Simone Luciani. There you go. And it developed your alien civilization among humans. Oh, it's another one, like uh, Origin First Tribes. Oh, they must have been so bummed when they saw Origin First Tribes did this. Hey, aliens helped ancient humans. But I really liked it, and I like Cranio, and I love Simone Luciani, who is in, my, I think, my top ten favorite designers of all time. So, yeah, bring it. Bring it. Bring that Dawn of the Gods. Okay. Um, gosh. Why? Why did that? That? That maybe should have been in my top 25. But look, I haven't looked at it since September. And so I just, obviously, I was scrolling through here and I didn't see a picture and I didn't remember the name. I said, I said pass. I'll talk about other stuff. All righty. Um, let's see. Slay the Spire. That's just a very popular video game, right? And I feel like I should look at it because the video game is so popular. Um, so that's why it's on the list. Wayfarers, Tiles of Arabian Nights, Autobahn, Viscounts, more West Kingdom stuff. Yay. Uh, Monster Pit, Overworld. I really dig. What is this? Um from Elza Corp. Catacombs. I really dig Catacombs. I have Catacombs 3rd Edition, and this sounds like it's got a co-op mode, and it's kind of a tower defense thing, so I'm, I'm interested because I like Catacombs so much. Galileo Project, well, that's certainly a pretty bit of box art, isn't it? Um, sorry, we are French. Oh yeah, this is the sequel to Ganymede. Ganymede is a very clever game. When I did my top 10 sci-fi game list a uh, couple of months ago, a collaboration with Shay Parker, one of the regular contributors on my channel, he listed G Ganymede as one of his uh, top five favorite sci-fi games of all time, and I couldn't blame him. So, it's a sequel to that. So, yeah. And I don't think there's anything other than that beautiful box art. So, that's all we know. But look at that. Ain't that pretty? And I love that polygonal style to the art. Okay. Um, ba -ba -ba -ba. Keep the Heroes Out, another fantastic... Oh, man, this is a cooperative Defend Your Dungeon from Heroes Who Are Coming In. Watch my run through. So much deep, wonderful stuff, and yet it's as hard. This is a really simple and easy to teach and play gateway game, but that works well for gamer geeks. So I'm very impressed by it. Bardwood Grove. This is uh, oh, I love it about this game. It's a deck builder where we're trying to save Bardwood Grove, but we do it by pacifying creatures, not by killing and hunting them. There's no violence in this game at all. We're just bards walking around, get, becoming better performers, entertaining people, telling stories, and pacifying the monsters so they don't have to be killed and they can just be relocated. I love everything about that. No surprise, considering everything I've said in this video so far. Flamecraft is a brilliant worker placement game with awesome pieces, the wonderful little dinosaur, or not dinosaur, dragon minis. Meeples and monsters, oh my gosh. Yeah, uh, that's finally coming. A very, very cool, um, what do you call it? Meeple Bag Builder. Uh, Earthborn Rangers. 
I looked at this a lot. I was thinking, because it looks really pretty, and I love the idea. This is another game. I talked about Mythwind. You know, the game where the world just grows and evolves over time the longer you play it. And it's not about you just, oh, no, I got to play, and we, and we win, and that's it. No, you just keep coming back, and you continue to explore the world. Okay, no pictures. Um, and I really love that idea. But I figured I already had Mythwind, and there's more information about Mythwind out there. And I was hoping somebody would ask this question so I could mention Earthborn Rangers in the, uh, the follow-up. Darwin's Journey, another game I covered. That's great. Wait a minute. Do I have two? I have two copies of Darwin's Journey in my wish list. That's silly. Um, do I? I'll fix that later. There's Mythwind. Kingdom Rush. More Kingdom Rush is coming. Oh, that's great. A Dice Kingdom of Valeria. A really good roll and write. Palace of Karar, second edition. An excellent update, Palace of Karar. I seriously considered putting hens on the list because this would be my wife's probably number one most anticipated game. It's just a silly little card game about managing a flock of hens. My wife loves, loves chickens. We we have 15, we have a flock of 15 chickens. And this game looks like, there have been other chicken-based games, but they were kind of silly and tongue-in-cheek. This looks like it actually takes them seriously and really shows off the full depth and breadth of, of chickenry, I guess. And so I suspect my wife will love this game so much. But I couldn't in good conscience do it. Um, because I just don't know enough about the game. Plus it looks like it's, a, it's still a fairly lightweight game, but oh man. Don't tell Jen. She's going to flip when I get this for her. Okay. Um, Titania Ascending, that rarest of beasts. A cooperative roll and write. We need more of that in the industry. Dungeon Crafters. This looked pretty cool. No art, though. So, you know, I just couldn't say enough. But it's a, it's a roll and write pen and paper where you are literally building your dungeon, roll and write style, and then fighting off heroes who come in. So, that's very, very cool. And hopefully it does not have that cartographer's thing of, oh, you're also trying to screw with your opponent's dungeons. Because that's why I can't play cartographers. Uh, Rolling Heights is a neat little game. This is a game where instead of rolling dice to see what you can do, you literally roll meeples. And if the meeples end up standing, they're powerful. If they end up on their, uh, on their side, they're half powerful. And if they're lying on their back, they, um, they, they bust, I think. And you can roll and re-roll them just like re-rolling dice, trying not to bust. Really clever idea. Uh, and then you're doing all that to be able to build skyscrapers. Hacktivity, I mentioned this, just barely missed. This is my 26. It almost made the list until I was kind of cheeky and put Plunderous on because I'm kind of involved a, a little bit. Uh, but this is a very, very cool looking cyberpunk. Uh, um, and this, I think, is probably going to be more, uh, uh, you know, Blade runner -y. Oh, it's kind of colorful too. But um, it, it says a very, very cool approach to deck building where you've got two decks you're dealing with, your action deck and the progress deck, and you're trying to deal with both of them simultaneously. It's pretty cool. I'm excited for it. Um, bah, bah, bah. Oh, Brussels, 1893, is getting a new deluxe reprint with a built-in expansion. Excited about that. Framework, a new game. One of those little kind of patchwork level games from Uwe Rosenberg. Fife, that's a... I don't remember what it was. Um, from designer Kosh. I don't know who that is, but it looked pretty. It looks pretty neat. Probably a little lightweight game. Surfboards? Are we surfing? I don't know. Um, right. Oh, Bot Factory, uh, which is... Oh, Bot is a remake something. Oh, this is Vita Lasarda revisiting Kanban and streamlining it down uh, along with designer... His co-designer... I bet this is his co-designer from Mercado de Lisboa, right? Uh, no, it's not. It's somebody else. Let's double check that. It's somebody who has done some stuff, uh, none of which I have heard of. Okay. But, I mean, Mercado de Lisboa didn't work for us because in the process of streamlining it down, they also made it a fairly aggressive game. Hopefully that doesn't happen with Bot Factory. It's more live and let live. Because I love Kanban, and I'd love a lighter Kanban that plays faster. Robotopia. Oh, I think this broke my heart. I don't think it, it funded when it was on Kickstarter back in November, I think. But I hope it makes it. I hope they relaunch and I hope it succeeds because this is one of the coolest new worker placement games I've played in years. Such a brilliant, so many brilliant ideas in this game. Really great presentation. Everything about Robot. This game should have blown up on Kickstarter and it broke my heart that it didn't. Uh, Hegemony, however, did blow up. I think actually I uh, these were both at the same time and Hegemony just took all the auction out of the room. Uh, this is a really cool, very deep, heavy, long um, Euro game where players are different leaders of different factions within a given society. Somebody um, represents the proletariat, somebody represents the uh, the one percenters, somebody represents the actual government itself, and everybody's playing a very... It's another one of these really asymmetric games where everybody's playing a different game, but they all have to interact and work together. I love that. It was a brilliant game. At the time, my only complaint was that if you wanted to play it two-player, you could only play the super rich and the working class. The other were left out of the game. 
as I understand it, they have since developed Automa characters. You can, in a two-player game, play with any character, and that makes me so happy. Ah, uh, let's see here. Oh, 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 and now we are into the fours, folks. We've left the threes like to have, so we're into the fours because I said, I don't remember looking at this at all. Uh, apparently, I looked at it a year ago. A year and a day ago, I marked this and said thinking about it, and I haven't heard anything about it since. So, that was that. Good question. Now, that was a long time. Let's see if folks have come up with more questions. Let me come back over here to the chat stream. Oh, my goodness. I remember there were some questions. All righty. Okay. Oh, let's see here. If I recall correctly, somebody had asked right off the bat, they had used their little, what do you call it, their... Notice so I could see the question really well. You know, okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go down to the bottom and I'm going to work upwards instead of downwards until I catch up. So, all righty. And um, let's see, I'm just scanning for question marks. Next question, please. Looks like everybody's just talking about what I'm talking about, which is nice. All righty. Will the Motor City Sheet be as huge as the Fleet one? I'm guessing. That's my guess, Razor Wind, because why wouldn't they? Why would they take a step back when um, Fleet the Dice Game was so fantastic? So, Let's see. Uh, uh, BG Orion says that What's Your Game needs to fulfill Madeira. That is true. If I recall correctly, didn't um, What's Your Game have like a couple of unfulfilled Kickstarters? Like, and they were Kickstarter expansions. I believe that was the case. And so that's why I'm, I'm, I'm if nothing else, um, I'm also worried that if, if they have curled up and gone away, that's heartbreaking because a lot of people gave them money. And the thing is, I mean, it's, it's hard to tell. But, you know, companies like What's Your Game, they're a very, they're like a, literally a mom and pop operation. And they're just barely, they were barely making ends meet back in 2019 when everything was awesome. And then the world changed and shipping, international shipping just exploded. The cost of wood exploded. You may have heard about this, that, you know, there were um, shortages of new houses being built because it was too expensive to build houses because wood got too expensive. Who else does that affect? Oh, I don't know. Companies that make little wooden meeples. It just crushed everybody. And, you know, I hope, hope, hope what's your game made it. I'm, I'm, I'm pulling for him. And if for no other reason, I, BG Orion, I'm assuming you're one of the ones who backed Majora. And believe me, I want those things too. So, I mean, fingers crossed. Fingers, fingers crossed. Okay. Um... <clears throat> Right, okay, Forest of Glass asks, I can't remember if you, if I have covered Clinic and the evolution of it. Did I like, yeah, Clinic is really cool. And why is Clinic not on my list? Why is Clinic not on my list? I'm not perfect, folks. This is not, I mean, it may have looked definitive. It's not a definitive list. There's going to be stuff I miss, including Clinic is getting a new reprint from another publisher, like a really big name publisher, if I recall correctly. So it's like a big deluxe uh, makeover, which is awesome. It's a very, very cool, very heavy, super heavy, like Vita Lasarda heavy hospital simulation that also deals with three dimensions because you have to worry about as you build your hospital, you're not only just building like one level, you're building the first floor, the ground floor and the first floor and the second floor and the where you put r rooms relative to each other on a floor, but also relative to each other above and below is hugely important to be able to get patients where they need to go really quick. It was really, really cool. It might've been one of those ones that's maybe a little bit too heavy for us though. All righty. What's the URL for my wish list? It's literally, um, who just asked that? Uh, Laz, it is wish, one word, wishlist.rado.com. W-I-S-H-L-I-S-T dot R-A-H-D-O dot com. And, uh, and you'll find it. Okay, and enjoy. It's there for everybody, not just for me. Although it's mostly just for me to keep track of stuff. All righty. Um, was Book of Villainy originally a Dr. Horrible game? Well, if so, I'm even more interested. Dr. Horrible... Um, was amazing. Okay. What are, 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 what, when am I going to do a top 10 Italian games video? Luciana, Tessini, Lapiano, Mangoni, uh, uh, you know, big, oh, that would be, that would be pretty amazing. That's, and that would be a good list. I don't know if there'd be any interest in it. I've never, I mean, it, it is an interesting idea, but it's never occurred to me. Hey, here's top 10 from French designers. Here's top 10 from Korean designers. Um, Plus, their names are so hard to say, and I always feel silly saying them. I always feel like I'm, you know, just kind of doing it too much, like I'm a cheap Mario knockoff. But, oh my god, there's, I mean, and I think, the thing is, I'm pretty sure all of them know each other, and they're all part of the same extended game group, I think. Or maybe there's just a couple of super groups. I'm not quite sure. I don't know what's going on there. Someday i got to get back to Italy and hang out with these people, um, because there's some brilliance going on there. Do, 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 what do we got here? 
Okay. Uh, Goblin says, I've occasionally said I've met them and they're lovely. So must be talking about what's your game, folks. Are there any companies you love where you met the people and didn't like them? No name to name. <laughs> No, that has not happened. Um, everybody, I mean, because this is, you know, when you meet somebody in person, any, oh, whoops, by the way, what am I looking at? I'm just looking at a big old screen of blackness. How about I come back up full screen? How about I do that? Is that is that big goof number five so far for the year? Yeah, I'm clearly not a professional streamer. Sorry about that, folks. That was dumb. What did I do? I, I minimized the browser and then I just left there like that. Oh, so dumb. Anyway, though, sorry. <laughs> and if you're on the podcast... I should just shut up because you wouldn't know that anything went wrong. Anyway, okay. Um, when you meet people in real life, any preconceived notions you have about them go out the window because it turns out the vast majority of people are good and nice. And maybe you disagree with them. Maybe they even have problematic opinions that make you really uncomfortable. But when you actually sit down, it's like, well, okay, we can talk about this. And so, no, I haven't seen that happen. I have seen the opposite. There have been some folks who are like, oh, I really have a problem with this person. And then I meet them at a convention and like, okay, we're cool now. We can fist bump. So, yeah, I, 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 don't, I can't think of a time that it's gone the other way, which would certainly be more salacious. Hey, everybody, before we continue on, I was thinking about that question a little bit more after the stream was over, and I felt like I should get back on and edit this in to add that my answer was definitely one that's born of, you know, kind of a white guy privilege situation. I'm obviously very big in the industry, and of course, people are going to be on their best behavior around me as a general rule, and I do not want to imply in any way, shape, or form that if someone was the victim of, say, online abuse, and they ended up running into their abuser in real life, that they should in any way, shape, or form feel obligated to try to reach out and find the human. You know, far be it for me to say that. That is not my intention at all. And I realize I'm in a very fortunate position that I can make that kind of thing happen, but it's not always that simple. There's obviously a lot of complexity in interhuman relationships, and I didn't mean to imply otherwise. It's just, oh, can't we all just get along? Sometimes, no, we can't. Sometimes there are bigger problems than just little disagreements one has on Twitter or what have you. So just wanted to be a little bit more clear about that. And uh, right, okay, let's get back to the Q&A. All righty. And uh, I'm back full screen now. Yeah. All right. Um, let's see. Oh, I see a lot of people were talking about the Madeira Kickstarter. Yeah. I, I, like I said, uh, what's your game? Please, please. All righty. Fa uh, Feldfan says, now, Feldfan, do you have any inside info that what's your game have literally gone belly up? That they have just pulled up stakes, have disappeared, and they have no intention on making good? Or is that presumption? I don't know. All righty. All right. And if so, it's just, it's really sad. I feel sad for everybody who wanted to get the game, but I feel sad for them too, because they're good people and the industry is worse for it because they were for years, the premier developer of the big, heavy, blow it out, do everything Euro. I mean, they gave Vito, would Vito Lasarda have his career if it weren't for what's your game? I mean, they put him on the map because they weren't afraid of his stuff back when his stuff seemed to be ridiculous by comparison. So all I can say is fingers crossed, and, and I, I, I wish for the best for everybody. Okay. Um, D -d -d. Oh, free donkeys for Lagrange. Huh? All righty. People are talking about things. I'm just scanning for question marks. Uh, oh, uh, Ruel. Ruel Gaviola apparently is here and says, Hey, what was the last game of 2021? First game in, played in tw first game 2022. Well, 2022, I mentioned this in the countdown, is going to be tomorrow. I'm hoping to play Free Radicals and the new species expansion for Endangered. Because uh, it's going to be my first chance to play Endangered with Jen. But. I might, not, I might have to play Free Radicals a bit more than I play most games before I cover it because there's so much variety with all the different um, types. Although maybe, I hopefully it has a, co a solo mode so I can just try all the different things and not take up so much of Jen's time to thoroughly play that. Last game we played of 2021, well, if you want to know that, you can just go to twitter.com slash Rotto. I will do that right now because I don't remember myself. Let's see, let's go to Twitter. Because every time I play a game for the first time, and sometimes, subsequent times, usually only for the first play, I take a picture and I post it on Instagram and Twitter and every place else. And the last picture I posted was Mystic Veil vale Harmony. Mystic Veil vale is how we ended 2021 and Free Radicals is how we will start 2022. Okay. Good question. Ruel. All righty. Uh, 
Right. Uh, first time chatter. Rainer, board. Rainer. Oh, board and dice. Oh my gosh, you guys were here. Um, I'm a little embarrassed now that I kind of really laid it on pretty thick about how great board and dice is. Rainer is uh, one of the developers, I believe, from board and dice. So uh, hopefully I didn't lay it on too thick. But yes, I mean, plan unknown. You're right, Rainer. It looks so fantastic. How did you let it slip between your fingers? Okay, what else have we got here? Um, am I interested in trying Arc Nova with the official variant of not using take that cards? Oh, by the way, uh, Blue Sapphire, thank you for subscribing. We are with using Prime, so it's free for you. And you basically just took money directly out of Jeff Bezos's pocket and put it in mine at no cost to yourself. You are awesome, Blue Sapphire. Thank you. Anyway, continuing on. Uh, that's the cool one of the coolest things about. Uh, uh, Twitch is the people. If you have an Amazon Prime subscription, you can subscribe to my channel for free. You won't see any ads. You get a stream avatar. I give you special bonuses. By the way, folks, if anybody is a new subscriber, um, before the show is over, scroll down and look. I've got a whole section d devoted to listing all the benefits I give subscribers. Some of them you have to direct message me for. So anyway, sorry, that's neither here nor there, and that certainly doesn't matter to the YouTube viewers or the podcasters. Um, but anyway, I'm sorry. Oh, Arc Nova, the official variant of not using Take That Card. Oh, yes, of course! I am going to chuck those in the trash. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to leave those in the box. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not even going to give them a... I'll look at them. I'll see what they do. But yay. I wish Terraforming Mars had had the foresight to do that. Uh, maybe I would have stuck with Terraforming Mars. Um, you know, and I'm sure it wasn't as simple as that. I'm sure they had to take that into account with the design. And they had to balance things accordingly. Because, I mean, uh, Jacob Ferrix, I say, is that the designer of Terraforming Mars? He has said that you can't just pull all the aggressive cards out of Terraforming Mars because it will mess with the balance of the game. He's posted that on Board Game Geek. And like, okay, well then fine. Terraforming Mars is not for me. Arc Nova might be. And more power to you for uh, going the extra mile, developers. All righty. Uh, do, do, do. Um, all right. Okay. Oh, oh, I think I've made it. I think I've made it. I'm back to... Uh, Tierno, what about all the games you covered? I think there were a couple of questions before his, but his was the one I really wanted to hit first because it was the really big topic, obviously. So let's go up a little bit more. And, um, right. Nathaniel Zillobis asks, do you generally back Kickstarters? For example, uh, did you back Darwin's Journey, Endless Winter, or Steffenfeld Collection? No, I don't. Uh, because here's the deal. Any game that I buy with my own money has a special place on my shelf right over there. You know, I've, I've got, I've got shrouded by one, two... Three Calyxes, and I've got about four cubbies of Calyx that are devoted to games I've bought. The problem with the games that I have bought is I will never get a chance to play them because my entire life is devoted to keeping up with all the games that publishers send me for coverage. Um, I mentioned wishlist.rado.com earlier. If you want to see, you can go to pubsent, P-U-B-S-E-N-T dot rado dot com. That will give you a list of everything that is sitting on my shelves waiting to be covered. If I could ever get ahead of that list, then I would crack out my seven wonders, or not my seven, my seventh continent, because I did buy all the expansion content for Seven Continent because I loved it so much. That's probably going to be gathering dust for 20 years until, or until such time as I quit doing Rottle Runs Through. So yes, I want, I mean, all these games I'm so excited about, I definitely want them, but if I get them, I literally have no room on my shelf for them. I'll just have to get rid of other games so it just doesn't make sense. So as a general rule, I don't. Um, and at the end of the day, I mean, I'm surrounded by 400 awesome games that I love. If I could never get another game for the rest of my life, I would be set. I would be golden. Yes, of course, I want to play all the new hotness, but I've been doing that nonstop for... How long have I been doing this? Um, almost 10 years. I mean, I'm, 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 um, yeah, in April, I will have been doing this for 10 years. Always, whatever's new, because I'm trying to give my audience what they want. You want to know what's new and exciting. You don't want to know about... Looking for an old, old game that is nearby. Uh, I mean, I've got a copy of World of Yoho. I so want to play that. Nobody cares if I, uh, and so I don't have time because I got to play Free Radicals and I got to play all this other stuff. So that is the conundrum I find myself in. All right. Uh, da -da 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 -da. All right. Uh, next up, Goblin uh, 981 asks, says, states that I have zero interest in playing video games, but I enjoy them. As a, uh, as a theme for board games. Explain yourself. I made video games for 20 years. I played video games. Here's my video game origin story. Here's my gamer origin story. At the age of four, in 1973, these numbers may be off by a year or so, <clears throat> my parents bought a 
Sears, from Sears Roebuck Company, a Pong machine. Sears had their own branded Pong machine. I'm pretty sure that was the case. And I never experienced anything like that in 1973. And here's the deal. At whatever I was, three or four years of age, my father was a god. He was Hercules. He could do anything. And I felt like a little in, you know, inadequate kid who could do nothing. But we got this Pong machine, and I was able to beat him regularly. It drove him nuts. He turns out he was not very sportsman about it. But it filled me with such self-confidence. It changed me. It made me think, look, this is something I'm good at. And I became a lifelong, I can't say video gamer. I became a lifelong gamer. Um, you know, all through the set. Remember, remember those old Mattel uh, Football 1 and Football 2, you know, the little um, LED games? I had all of those. I had an Atari 2600. I had a friend who had an Odyssey 2, and I really was jealous. I had a friend who had an Intellivision. I was really jealous because I just had the 2600. And, um, you know, and I also, I went off to college, and what was the first thing I did is I got myself a job at Nintendo because I love video games so much. That led to a career designing video games. And it was only... 10, 11 years ago that I accidentally stumbled across Pandemic at a friendly local game store in Seattle. And my wife and I took it on a trip and it forever changed our lives. And slowly, bit by bit, I find myself less and less interested in playing video games because I couldn't share them with my wife the same way I could share board games. And it doesn't mean I don't still have, obviously, I would think from that story, a really deep reservoir of love and nostalgia for video games. So that was me explaining myself. I'm sure you were joking around with all the 50 billion, um, what do you call it, question marks. But that's there, there's, a, there's a gamer origin story for you. All right. Um, let's see. Okay. Oh, thank you. Slivers noticed. Oh, man, I should have done that. That Rainer is in. And so Rainer confirmed that the game I talked about, I think it was like my number what? My number five or something like that is pronounced Tiletum. Tiletum. And it means hat in Latin. Tiletum. All righty, I'm going to promptly forget that. Please, Rainer, put it in the rulebook like you did for Zapotec. That was so awesome. There I go again. Um, shilling for board, uh, for board and dice. But hey, it's it's easy when they're really awesome. Okay, and I made no money from that transaction. I'm just genuinely enthusiastic. Folks, I'm an enthusiastic guy. I'm just, that's just me. All righty. How do you get an avatar for the screen is a reward? Okay, I'm sure uh, Peter uh, Venley, uh, Ven, Ven, Ven you, you figure that out by now. All right, okay, it looks like I'm caught up. Uh, and so now I'm going to scroll all the way to the bottom and probably some more questions have come in and I'll just start working backwards again. What a perfect way. I don't miss anything this way. Fem Sensei asks, if I was approached to do a video game, by a video game house, to port one of my previous games into virtual reality, would I be tempted to rejoin the industry? Oh, you're a monster. Why do you ask me? Yes. There are a few things that could pull me back in. Um, and... That's, an, that's a really interesting one. I do have an Oculus. I got an Oculus Quest. The, the two, I think. I think Oculus Quest 3 is the white one. I got the one, and I got it just like a few months before they released the three, and like, ah, I got the junk crap one now that's twice as heavy and half the resolution. But I still have it, and my, my wife and I, we use it for Supernatural VR. It's an exercise program that's fantastic. I got it, though, because I thought, oh, maybe this will reignite my love of video games. I tried a bunch of stuff. It did not. It was interesting. It was fun. But ultimately, it's just a really good replacement for having a personal gym in your house. Um, but still, I mean, Pistol Whip is amazing. Pistol Whip, uh, if you haven't tried it for, I'm sure it's available on all VR platforms. It is real. I mean, I actually, Pistol Whip, playing it so much and realizing how exhausted I got is what kind of prompted me to think, oh, maybe I should try exercising with this. And that led to... I can never remember of it, the, uh, not Beat Saber, but the uh, Beat Saber clone that's available for free via browser VR. And that ultimately led to Supernatural. I'd be tempted. I would certainly think about it long and hard because that would be a really interesting and engaging challenge creatively to do that. Plus, you sweeten the deal by making me revisit some of my old favorites because that's another thing that would maybe pull me back. I would love to rework, I would love to work on Siphon. My first game as a lead designer was Siphon Filter 1. And then I did Siphon Filter 2 and then I left and did many other things over the years. And I've often thought about what would uh, a new next-gen siphon filter, and a siphon filter VR, that blows my mind. So I would be tempted, but this is hard to give up. Working for myself, I remember how terrible it was, and I don't think the industry has changed much. I think I'd still be uh, running right back to making my wife, uh, she always referred to herself as a video game widow when I worked in the video game industry because 
I would work fifth, you know, um, 60 hour weeks, 52 weeks a year for years at a time. Uh, my biggest record is not leaving the office for four days straight, sleeping on the floor or on a couch when we're in a crunch. And I'm too old for that S quite frankly. Um, oh, I see. I am Johnny man agrees that pistol whip is fantastic. I haven't played it in months and I know they were starting to release a bunch of new stuff. I should really go back and look at it, but I got other stuff to do today. Okay. Um, what else have we got? Fable and VR says Fem Sensei. Yeah, I mean, Fable. I have mixed feelings about. I'm very proud of Fable. I was a I was a co lead designer on Fable too. Me and Dean Carter shared those responsibilities, and I'm really proud of Fable. But it was a hard game. It was probably the hardest game I ever worked on. I mean, it took a physical toll on my health, and so much so that after it was done, I left Lionhead and went on to uh, work at Splash Damage. So. But I do have a fondness for it. I would never, I would never work on a Fable game if Dean Carter, the original co-creator from Big Blue Box, Dean and, and Simon, but specifically Dean, were not at the very least a consultant on the game, signing off on everything. And as far as I know, I've, I've not heard anything about that that's happening with the new Fable that's being developed up in, oh, where was it? Birmingham, I think? I forget, I forget. You know, the, the uh, it's being developed by a bunch of, race game developers. I, I hope they're cons it, There's no way any of them are hearing this. And it's no way that even if they did, it'd be too late anyway. But anybody out there who's working on the new Fable for Xbox, whatever, I don't even know what, is it 720 now? I genuinely don't know. Um, contact Dean Carter. He's easy to get in touch with. He's on Twitter. He posts all the time. He's hilarious. And he is the heart and soul of Fable. And if you do not have Dean Carter on your game, you have not made a Fable game. You have made something else. Just saying. All right, sorry. That's neither here nor there. That's uh, me uh, waxing rhapsodic about my former life. All righty. Um, let's see here. What else have we got? Blue Highway Games, Force of Glass points out, was the game that changed my life. And you know what? In a tiny way, it changed all of your lives because you're here today right now instead of doing something else. So you have Blue Highway Games to thank for that. Oh, you had a ColecoVision slivers. I was also very... Oh, no, that you had something else. I was super jealous of a ColecoVision. That Smurf game. Oh, my God, that looked amazing. That was so cutting edge. All right. Uh, do, do, do. What, asked James, about Star Trek Super Pinball 4 k I seriously considered... Oh, um, let me take that off screen. I had the notice. I've had that on screen the whole time. Oh, man, I keep making mistakes. Anyway, I'm sorry, folks. To James's question... I, I, I was so cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs over Star Trek missions, re um, you know turn, putting Star Trek on Fantasy Realms. What about Star? What was it called? Star Trek Super Pinball 4K taking Star Trek, including Star Trek. Um, it, 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 what does it have? It has a uh, a next gen a TOS board, a lower decks board, and I think a DS9 board. Is that correct? I think that's correct. Well, first of all, I felt I already felt silly putting one of them on this on the list, and I didn't want to put two. And I think, was it Super Pinball 4K is a brilliant design from uh, from Engelstein, from not Sydney Engelstein, Jeff Engelstein. I always think of Sydney, the next generation, whenever I think Engelstein, uh, because of Aeon's End, of course. But um, I loved it. I thought it was so well done, except for the fact that it was just ridiculously long. A roll and write as light as that should not take over an hour to play. And as far as I know, they have not addressed that. They have just said, nope, um, these games are just crazy, crazy long. And so that's what gave me pause about Super Star Trek, Super Pinball 4K. If somebody could tell me that, oh yeah, you know what? Um, Jeff Engelstein released an official variant that said, hey, look, if you would like to play the game in 30% faster time, do this or this or this, and it won't break the balance of the game, and you can have a half hour experience or whatever. There you go. You can have a 50% shorter experience, depending on your speed of play. If anybody can tell me that Jeff has done that, or if that has worked its way into the rules of the expansions, or this new Star Trek one, yeah, then I would have put it on the list. But I just had hesitancy because I thought Star Trek Super Pinball 4K was brilliant, but it just... It was too long. Too long. Much like that answer, I imagine, was too long. Alrighty. Um, oh, let's see. Master Goblin Games asks... How do I decide all the games behind me? Um, well, on a certain level, no real rhyme or reason. As new stuff comes in that I'm really happy about, like, I mean, I, I like to highlight things. I mean, circling squ or squaring, squaring Circleville is brilliant. Nobody knew about it. When I covered it, the publisher didn't know. Uh, they, they had nobody lined up to actually bring it over to a wider audience. 
And um, you know, when I posted, the designer said, "Yeah, we still don't have anybody lined up." Now, I think he sent that to me in an email. I have since heard that I believe Capstone has picked it up. Now, I that could have been in the works anyway. I don't know if I had any impact on that, but I like highlighting it because I want more people to see it and play the game. Uh, spoiler alert for my top ten games of the year: Roll Camera is my top rated game of 2021. Um, I love the works of Vladimir Suchi. I mean, all these games are just ones that I thought about, you know, what am I going to put in front? Like, oh, that makes me happy. I'll go Indus. Indus 2500 BC is not the greatest roll and write of all time. It's a very good roll and write. I'd play it over cartographers. I put it there because I want to more people to notice and say, hey, what's that about? Because it's developed by a plucky little independent game publisher in India that are trying to break out into the broader world. And I want to bring more attention to that. It's mostly, I mean, I, you have to bear in mind, I mean, I, as a former game developer myself for 20 years, I don't look at these as just games. I look at these and think of the people behind these games. I can't help it. It's hardwired into me because I was one of those people. So I, I look at every one of it's. It's why it's very, very hard for me to be harsh about a game. I will do constructive criticism. Whenever I am criticizing anything, like Super Pinball 4K, for example. I talked about this when I covered it. Uh, that was too long. I always present it as if I was sitting down at a table with the designer. And how would I say? I wouldn't sit down with uh, Jeff Engels saying, oh, by the way, Jeff, you really blew it, buddy. You totally... I mean, this game could have been amazing, but it's crap. What's wrong with you? Which is what people tend to do. Or, you know, throw things in the garbage, you know, symbolically, or throw things off the roof. You know what I'm talking about. Symbolically. I hate that. It drives me nuts. Because... All I think about is the people behind this cardboard and how much that hurts, how much that stings, how much that is not something you would ever do if you were talking to them in person. And so I, I you know, that's that's something very, very important to me that really maybe informs you a lot about the reality of my channel and why I present information the way I do because of my background and where I come from. Okay. Good question though, Master Goblin. I did, I just kind of went on a rant. Um, but it was a rant that I would say in person to anybody too. Uh, wait, uh, Fem Sensei says, Arc Nova doesn't require you to move, remove the, oh, that's right. Yes. Fem Sensei. So Arc Nova, oh, it breaks my heart. Why did every channel in the universe get a copy of that game except for me? I am all but positive. It's going to make my top 10. We'll revisit that in May, April or May. I'm sure I will eventually get a copy of the thing. But yeah, it's not that you just remove the aggression cards. It's all the aggression cards have an alternate function that, so they stay in the deck that they still fulfill the balance requirements they have for the overall simulation. That's so brilliant. Oh, that's so brilliant. Was that Fire Robin? Is Fire Robin the publisher behind that? If so, that makes sense because they are brilliant people. See, I, I every game I think about as people. The, the games are people to me. I, I can't help it. Uh, and thanks for reminding me, Fem Sensei. That makes me so happy. Um, that makes this... Oh, should I do it? Yeah. That makes this a very happy new year for me indeed. I'm coming back and I'm going to slap a sticker on screen. Yeah, happy new year. Which, uh, by the way, YouTubers, I know you can't see it. Podcasters, you can't hear it. If you watch on Twitch, there's all kinds of stuff happening that I just basically hide. Uh, stream avatars doing dances and stickers and and floating emojis and um, events and and hey, we haven't done it for a while. Let's have a battle royale. Well, I mean, yeah, that's gonna that'll be fun. Battle royale. Boom. Okay. So, um, everybody that's watching who is a subscriber of the channel is about to engage in a Squid Game-esque duel to the death. And only one can survive, and they will get 100 gold points they can use to customize their avatars. That's what you get to do if you actually show up on Twitch and watch live. Anyway, though. Um, sorry, that's neither here nor there. I'm going to go back to asking questions. Uh, that was a really good question, though, Master Goblin. I don't think... I, I'm sure somebody must have asked me that before. Okay. All right... Um, ba, 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 ba. I'm scrolling fast. So uh, my apologies to anybody. If I, if you had a question and it was really important to you and I missed it, I'm really sorry about that. Um, I generally try to answer all the questions afterwards. Thank you, Slivers, for um, gifting a month subscription to Crystal Dax. Crystal Dax! I hope you're doing okay. I, I, I heard the, uh, the other day and I, I, um, I mean, as a fellow Trekkie, um, you are probably the only person in board game media who is maybe a bigger Star Trek nut than me. So, I'm sending you all the well wishes. Um, hi, Crystal. All right. Anyway, well, I, I don't know if you're typing anything because I'm way scrolled up in the chat. I can't see what's coming later. Anyway, though, everybody send well wishes to Crystal Dax. She is awesome, and not just because she loves Star Trek almost as much as me. 
Uh, we should do a uh, Star Trek podcast, Crystal. Anyway, sorry, that's not here or there. Um, I, I'm really going off the rails. How long have I been going? I've been going for two hours and 20 minutes. Actually, it's more like two and a half hours because I started before noon, so I'd be ready for the raid. Oh, you know what, folks? Oh, I am so sorry. So if you add, or, oh, 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 sorry, uh, yeah, um, right. I see uh, Buddha Kayak put in all caps the word question, so it made it easier for me to spot. Thank you, Buddha. I maybe should start requiring that. I don't know. Oh, and who won? Who won the fight? I missed it. Uh, the, the Battle Royale. With all the new games I play, is there a list of games that Jen and I make sure to play every year? No. So that's the thing. World's smallest violin. Can you see it? Can you see it playing just for me? Can you hear it? It's really tiny. It doesn't make much noise. Um, it, it doesn't happen. Um, when we were still in Malta, three years ago, we did. we had one thing. Every Sunday, didn't matter what else was going on, we set aside, Sunday was Gloomhaven Day. And we were going to play one, sometimes two missions of Gloomhaven. We did that for a year. And that is how I was able to actually finish the entire Gloomhaven campaign. Never been able to get back to that. There are, I mean, I want to do that with Seventh Continent. I want to do that with Sleeping Gods. Uh, there are so many of these um, campaign games that I would like to spend the time. But uh, ever since I've been back, um, now that when I was in Malta, it was harder for publishers to get copies of games to me. Now that I'm in America, it is much easier. If anything, the amount of games that I cover has increased dramatically. So I just don't have time. Um, so, I mean, but the, but the closest I have is... I mean, I think I mentioned, hey, there's Agricola expansions coming, right? If those can come in, if a publisher sends me that, that gives me an opportunity to say, oh, look, I got to cover this expansion. That means we get to play some Agricola. Yay, we haven't played Agricola for two years, and it's in my top 10, it's in her top 20. Yay for expansions. So that's about as close as we get to revisiting some of our favy faves. Uh, but yeah, there's no list at, at all. That Gloomhaven Sundays was the closest I've ever come to it. Okay, folks. I am exhausted, so I think this is where we're going to call it a close. And I want to thank everybody for watching. Hope you have a great new year. Have a nice day. Talk to you later. So long. Bye-bye.